Tommaso. Okay, so I think we can uh, then get started. Sorry for the delay. Um, so good afternoon, good evening, good morning, a warm greeting to all of you and to my students and former students around the world included. I'm Simonetta Vizzosa, I'm a research and teacher, Trent University up in the Italian Alps. Um, so I slept at night, sleepless night, notwithstanding, uh, I'm absolutely honored and thrilled to be chairing this virtual debate, uh, Interoperability and the EU Digital Markets Act. It is organized by the Open, for Open Forum Academy and I'm a member of this academy. Well, the ingredients, are civil society, law, tech, economics, relatively gender balanced. This is uh, the recipe of a uh, panel and this is uh, almost a perfect panel. Let me introduce the wonderful uh, panelists uh, to you. Well, uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, um, somebody representing the civil society. I think it's a very important presence. So, Katarzyna uh, Szymielewicz. Uh, she's the head of the Panopticon Foundation. And uh, she's uh, um, and the Panoptico Foundation is a non-governmental organization based in Poland, where among other things they imagine and test different strategies on how to curb digital surveillance. Then uh, we have two lawyers, and the, uh, the first one is Lisa Lofder Gormson, and uh, she's the director of the Competition Law Forum and Senior Research Fellow in Competition Law, British Institute. Uh, of the uh, British Institute of International Comparative Law. And then I've, I've seen in the chats that there are some, uh, there are people with issues with audio. I hope everything is fine. <laughs> but then we have Agustin Reina. He's Director of Legal and Economic Affairs at uh, the Bureau Européen des Unions des Consommateurs, the BUC, which is the umbrella group for 45 independent consumers organizations from 32 countries. Then we have two technologists, uh, Ian Brown, who is a computer scientist specialized in privacy, security, and interoperability. He has many hats, but uh, he prefers to be <laughs> called, uh, he calls himself independent researcher. Then Vittorio Bertola, head of policy and innovation, Open Exchange, which is a German company, I found out, with offices also in Paris, mm, Madrid, Turin, and US, which focuses on open source solutions for companies. Then, last but not least, we have with us an economist, or I should perhaps say the economist, Tommaso Valletti, professor at Imperial College of London and former chief economist at the European Commission DG competition. So, how are we going to stage this virtual debate? Uh, there will be a first round of questions from my side, and then we will open the floor to questions from you and the audience, and I will I warn you that I will be shamelessly self-preference my students if they post questions, so if they recognize names, because this, this uh, webinar actually replaces my lecture. So very briefly, what is the virtual panel about? Well, you'd be forgiven for having a feeling of déjà vu, because we have been here before, uh, not virtually, but physically in Brussels and exactly 10 years ago. I was there, by the way. At a speech delivered to Open Forum Group uh, Europe in 2010, Nili Cruz, who was then uh, EU com competition commissioner uh, in the long aftermath of the EU Microsoft case, said that complex antitrust investigations followed by court proceedings were perhaps not the only way to increase interoperability. She said that she intended to seriously explore all options to ensure that significant market players cannot choose to deny interoperability with their product. And she also said that it was certainly possible that the result of this exploration could be a legislative proposal, 2010, by way, a way of which to achieve interoperability, these words, on an ex-ante basis, that is, without having to conduct proceedings under competition. So 10 years later, where are we? Well, a tsunami of reports, studies, there has been a, a, the announcement of the Digital, Digital Services Act, which should comprise asymmetric ex ante regulation of very large online platforms acting as gatekeepers, but also new competition law tool, uh, which is a new market investigation regime. regime. And then uh, the quite a lot of proposals, uh, quite concrete, is an amendment to German competition law, section 19A of the um, German Competition Act, uh, 
uh, which uh, um, should be able to prohibit uh, undertakings. Uh, so I have it. In, so undertake with paramount significance for competition across mass across markets. They should be prohibited from uh, uh, hindering interoperability of products and services and the portability of data. So quite a lot of things going on. Okay. So in a nutshell. Interoperability could be part of the package of the pro-competition interventions that they are designed to tackle the sources of tremendous market power held by digital platforms by overcoming barriers to entry and expansion. Briefly, that was my introduction. My first question to Ian. I see you there. <laughs> Let's switch on your camera as well. Uh, so, Ian, from a technical perspective, is interoperability a pipe dream of some competition economists, lawyers, and civil society groups? Or is it practical? Is it doable? Ian? Are you there? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just jumping in from the off. I'm Sivan from Open Forum Europe. Ian is having some issues downloading Firefox right now. Uh, okay, so, so never mind. I jumped to the. Uh, we can get back to him later. So, Victoria. Right. Okay, <laughs> no problem. So, what, uh, Victoria? So, what have we learned so far? Because I mean, one of the aspects of it would be standard setting. Okay, open standards. So, what have we learned so far about uh, achieving solutions to, to interoperability problems through standard setting? Specific specifically in the ICT sector, because what, that was one of the ideas. Nothing much was done, but the idea was to support that also at the European level. So what about the effectiveness of non-legislative measures, such as model licenses for interoperability information, guidelines, etc., as was suggested in 2013, staff working document analysis of measures that could lead significant marketplace to license interoperability information. So, Victoria, thank you. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, the standard setting is an important part of the problem, but it is just a part of the problem. So, of course, if you want to enable interoperability, you need to have open standards, they need to be freely accessible, free of uh, IPR restrictions, then we can discuss what it means, if it's planned or whatever. But you don't create interoperability just by making the standard or by licensing the standard. I mean, for example, if you take instant messaging, which is the, I mean, the, possibly the, the easiest case of, of, of uh, uh, application where we do not have interoperability and we would like to have it. Uh, for instant messaging, there is no lack of technical standards. There are plenty of them, at least a couple of them, which are open and, and could work immediately. But the problem is that uh, the dominant platforms do not use these standards. Or, or if they use them, they use them, but they deploy them in closed ways. So the, the standard, the protocol of communication is open, but they ref refuse to exchange uh, messages with uh, anyone else uh, except for their own app and their own servers. So uh, we should stop seeing interoperability as an IPR issue. It is a competition issue, but it's a much broader issue. It's also an issue about consumer protection, and in the end, it even impacts uh, fundamental rights, not just the economy. So I think that both sides are, are important. So I mean, I, I'd say that the, the document from 2013 is showing uh, the, its age, uh, because, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, it, it's just, uh, I, I think we can discuss about the positions. But uh, I mean, uh, the document says about, I mean, that, that we should foster cultural licensing exchange in the spirit of open innovation. But dominant platforms don't really care about community spirit. They just care about their business interest. And uh, also, I mean, the, the other point I think uh, that, that I think is worth waiting, making very quickly is that uh, open standard setting processes are customarily captured by the dominant companies. It, because they, exactly because they are open, which is good. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the, some companies can just send uh, 100 people and just to capture the process. So open doors are not enough. I mean, there, sometimes there are other industry sectors, or even, for example, the European uh, industry that show up, but cannot really get a voice because they're just a few people. I mean, even other stakeholders, non-technical ones, they can enter the room, but in the end, due to the culture, to the fact that there are insiders and been working on this for 20 years, they get ignored. Even uh, the ITF, which is, I mean, in, ways, in, a, in a way, it's the good model, the one that has uh, made the internet grow, but the ITF also has a political agenda of its own about uh, encryption, about uh, disempowering government or the internet, and I mean, whatever you think about it, I mean, the, you, you see this need that you have to reconcile these standard processes. We share public policy objectives that, that are really multi-stakeholder for multi-stakeholder multi settings and not just by the technical community or by the, these I mean, big dominant platforms. So paradoxically, the last message I want to give is that sometimes even the internet as the are not very multi-stakeholder. Uh, 
So that's also something we need to address. So much, Victoria. Uh, perhaps just uh, so. The question then for interoperability, if it's part of the digital market side, would be then what type of provision and obligations and how will it be framed also in legal terms? And that would be my question uh, to August, Augustin. So from the legal perspective, uh, how would a truly effective interoperability requirement for digital gatekeepers within the digital market side possibly look like? So, and the, the other thing I, I wanted to perhaps uh, uh, hear your thoughts about is the fact that, of course, competition authorities have experience with interoperability to some, some extent. There have been uh, remedies uh, in merger cases, there have been a couple of uh, cases uh, also at uh, national competition authorities. What have we learned from it? So, thank you, Agustin, for yours. Thank you very much, Simonetta, and thank you to the colleagues or colleagues of um, uh, Open Forum Europe for the for the invitation. It's, it's great to be discussing this as a kind of a break from the, <laughs> the news across the Atlantic. Um, actually, I will, it's, it's true that we have been discussing uh, interoperability issues in, in, in competition cases, um, particularly from the point of view of what we call vertical interoperability, while well, here we're more in the field of uh, horizontal interoperability. Um, but I think what is um, perhaps more, more, more interesting is um, to discuss what are the different regulatory models that we already have uh, across sectors. And actually, I like what, what Vittorio said at the beginning. It's not all about standards. It's about creating actually obligations that will then develop um, to develop then such, um, such standards. And I think that I, in, in, in this discussion, in the context of the Digital Services Act or the Digital Markets Act or whatever we want to we wanna call it, there are basically kind of three big models that we can explore. So the first model, which is based on a case-by-case -case assessment, um, for example, in the context of the, of the new competition uh, tool, which has some benefits because you don't need to define in advance which are the markets or the product categories to which you would apply interoperability, but just simply through a case-by-case -case assessment, you identify that are um, structural market problems, you can impose it as a, um, as a, as a remedy. But we have also more developed kind of schemes that relate to interoperability slash data 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 access, like for example, in the context of the electronic communication code or the um, uh, payment services directive regarding open banking. And I think these are very um, interesting models, and we can learn a lot from them. If we think of the electronic communication code, although these have not been yet put in practice, there is a possibility for NRAs to impose uh, interoperability to OTTs over um, over the top um, uh, communication um, services. And what is interesting is that it can be implemented either um, as a general term for, 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 the, for all the OTTs, but only also linked to um, SMP test. Uh, so actually have the two the two possibilities um, and the the system in how this is going to be implemented is quite detailed uh, regarding the different committees and the standardization process that need to be involved and then we have the um, payment services directive model which basically the PSD2 um, uh, impose an obligation to give access to the API and then the whole process of implementation is left to the European Banking Authority. And what is interesting through our experience, because actually BEOG is also part of that discussion, we also now start seeing the tensions between the banks. Because, for example, um, uh, ideally you will have one dedicated interface which is identical for all banks. So every single payment service provider can access that. But of course, the bank, what we're trying to push is for their own uh, dedicated interface, which means that the payment service providers will have to adapt to every single model, which technically is very difficult and extremely burdensome, and at the end, just place barriers to, uh, to, to entry. So I think that we can learn actually from these, these experiences. We can discuss about having a regulatory um, mechanism or a, a legal obligation to grant uh, interoperability, but we need to, very, to think very carefully about how is the model we're going to use for implement it with all the risks that that, uh, that that entails. Um, so maybe I, I leave it here and, and we, can, we can discuss more on the, on the details uh, afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Augustine. And perhaps if uh, Ian is back with us, I would uh, perhaps uh, 
uh, link to what Agustin has been just saying about some issues with the PSD2. Uh, and perhaps a more virtual example in that respect would be open banking. And generally, my question to you, uh, again, is uh, sort of on a technical perspective, is interoperability a pipe dream of some competition economists, lawyers, and civil society groups, or is it really doable? I think um, open banking and, and PSD2, which underlies it, is, is a really good example because um, as I, Agustin was just explaining some of the, the difficulties that can arise if you set very high level obligations in law, but then don't have the, the implementation mechanisms to really make things work. So the, the UK has, has built on top of BS, PSD2, created this program called Open Banking, um, used uh, various other regulatory powers um, that, the, that exist in the, the UK financial sector and really got our, I think it's nine largest banks to work together really closely to define common standards and APIs and processes. And even to the extent there's a there's an organization called the Open Banking Implementation Entity, um, which actively monitors how well this is working. And even on its website, it publishes statistics every month about how many API calls have failed, for example, across the whole um, the whole system. And I think that's a really good model for us to think about if we were thinking about making um, you know, whether it's instant messaging, whether it's social media, which would be two obvious starting points, um, uh, really work together in practice. Um, I promise all the, the viewers the problems we've had was not, you know, staged. Um, it's a reminder. Uh, I had never used this platform before today. I had incorrectly assumed that because I use the second most commonly used web browser, Safari, uh, that this platform would work with that. No, I've had to go and install Firefox while um, while you were all talking uh, to get it to get it to work. I mean, we 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 have um, you know just to to go back to your pipe dream point. Um, we take it for granted in many ways with many technologies that interoperability works really well. The internet is based around interoperability, you know, in particular, a standard called the Internet Protocol. That's the whole way the internet works, uh, you know, which was standardized going back, you know, at least to 1981 to one of the most important recent standards. But going back further than that, the telephone networks all work together in this way because there are common technical standards and they've been required. Um, by governments in Europe and elsewhere to, to interconnect their networks. Going back to the 19th century, telegram, the telegram system was made interoperable, was interconnected by what is now the ITU, one of the, you know, one of the world's first big technical standards bodies. So interoperability as a technical matter, and I, I'm a computer, computer scientist, absolutely can work and absolutely can support functionality such as end-to-end -end encryption. Um, but you do need the standards processes, which, which Vittorio was talking about a bit as well, to, to work to do that. And I think um, open banking um, and this experience is a reminder as well. We would probably need something similar uh, under the Digital Markets Act, where the people that were, that were uh, creating the products and services could, could work together, uh, overseen in the public interest, so not a small cartel of the biggest companies frustrating their competitors uh, you know making a load of different standards slightly incompatible standards not paying quite enough attention to the user experience and so on those are important details to, to get right but absolutely i think it can be done thank you so much ian for these encouragements uh, perhaps you should also be reminded that the the financing model of the uh, open bank implementation entity paid by the banks themselves. <laughs> so that's very handy, of course. That's a matter of resources there. Thank you so much. And then we, we stay in the UK and, um, and a little bit, uh, is Lisa, is she there? Because I can't see the video. Well, I pose the question and then we'll see. So uh, in the case of Facebook, the CMA in the final report on digital platforms and online advertising discuss uh, in particular cross-posting and content interoperability. If you made it until uh, Annex W, uh, the, the CMA also developed a, a very uh, promising framework, I think, to be applied uh, to interoperability more broadly. Uh, also thinking of uh, impact on innovation incentives, etc. And so, Lisa, if you are there, what's your take on it? 
or more generally, what, when do you think that the case for mandated interoperability is greater in order to promote innovation and competition? But I can see Lisa. Is there anybody from the organization able to step in and tell me what happened? <laughs> Well, let's imagine she will appear soon again. Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, I, yes, I was I, <laughs> just doing some troubleshooting, so I only heard the, the back part of your statement, but I assume it's about Lisa. Um, yeah, we're still trying to figure out the browser issues. Uh, it seems to be related. Okay, to never Safari. mind. No problem. We perhaps then we move to to uh, Tommaso. So the economist on the panel, and what are or what are the economists that we have it? Here. So from an economics perspective, of course, there are quite a lot of arguments which speak in favor of interoperability and a few ones also related to innovation incentives, uh, homogeneous products that are against uh, them. Uh, then the question would be, is it now the framework of uh, ex-ante, of this ex-ante approach, taking into consideration these platforms with those <laughs> enormous uh, powers they have, a uh, little bit different uh, than our new normal discussions about interoperability. So we have learned a lot from these reports in the last two years or something. And uh, the other thing is, okay, the argument would be, well, we did it for uh, uh, telecom. Okay, but then the argument from the other side would be, no, it's different. There are other markets, other issues there. So, Tomas, what would be your take on that? Hi, Monica, and hello to everybody. Uh, so, um, from an economics point of view, interoperability is related to rather strong economic concepts, which are related to externalities. So, we, we want to make sure that externalities are enjoyed because they bring some efficiencies and there are different kind of externalities you might search because you can use more data to refine you know, the quality of the searches or you can see your friends but let's assume these are all positive externalities so that's great this is bringing efficiency but you want to also to make sure that those efficiencies are actually going to be given to users and that they don't stay with the firms alone and you need competition for that so the problem that we're currently experiencing is that we do have externalities, but they're not enjoyed industry-wide. They are enjoyed by particular players within their own ecosystems. So you want to make sure that externalities are not um, accruing to a single player, but they can, be, they can benefit other players because those players will, will bring competition and finally users will benefit. So that's fine. Um, there are trade-offs, of course. Also, these trade-offs are well understood, both in theory and in practice. And typically, they go under the simple heading of, well, there is competition in the market, and competition in the market is facilitated by interoperability, but there is also competition for the market. So let's, let's make sure we don't destroy this dynamic phase of competition for the market. But this is not new. This is something we knew, for instance, as you alluded to in telecommunications, and uh, we we dealt with it in, uh, te in telecommunications. Those who remember Exanta, which we still have a little bit, Exanta regulation in telecommunications, the markets recommended for some Exanta regulation had to satisfy the, th the so-called three criteria. And the three criteria tests were related to the fact that there should be high barriers to entry, and so think about search. It's, uh, there are high barriers to enter if you want to become a new search engine. This, uh, the, the market structure should not be tending towards effective competition. And again, if, if, if you think of search, they've been dominant for the past uh, 12, 13, 15 years. And so, so the, the indicators are all there that this is not just a, a transitory phase. And also the third test of the three criteria test was that exposed competition policy would not be good enough to tackle the, the problems that I think we have enough experience so far with all the Google cases, the time it takes, that competition policy to say the least is not a very good instrument to deal with that. So if I have to think about those three criteria tests, they, they would apply almost on you know, one for one in the, in the cases of many of the, of the, of the platforms that we are we're talking about. We also learned that the regulations that were in had to be asymmetric. They wouldn't apply to every platform, but there was clearly a competition problem because the ultimate objective of interoperability and interconnection rules in telecommunication was 
to you know invigorate or facilitate the so-called ladder of investment so making sure that ultimately there would be some some alternative operators that could challenge the incumbents and that's what we want and, and this is going to come with a differentiation it's going to come with alternative products in, in uh, increasing choice increasing investment and so forth so there's lots of similarities and also differences the differences differences is that um in telecoms, at least, interoperability and access regulation has been over prices mainly. So we had prices and we had to find some numerical value for those prices. We also learned, however, and there is an analogy that precisely because access was regulated and hence profits or large profits cannot be, could not be made any longer on access, incumbents started what we called back then sabotage. So doing non-price discrimination making sure that access to the to the rivals were, would be not of good enough quality you know, not fixing uh faulty lines or being slow in responding and uh and so we had to deal a lot with uh, non-price regulation too and this is going to be incredibly important in, in many of these markets because there are no prices especially when it comes to self uh, pre pre preferencing and this means a couple of things to think that we really need to get our hands dirty to find solutions, because if I think of um, functional separation of British Telecom 15 years ago, it came with uh, 236 undertakings, so commitments of uh, BT, who had to say exactly how open reach would not discriminate vis-a-vis -vis other uh, players that were not integrated in the BT group. In the case of Google, say, we will need to have, perhaps, I'm not um, a technical expert, access to the algorithm, which makes it very difficult to understand exactly what that preference is, is, is going to mean. We have to be, uh, there are solutions there, for instance, make sure that a product uh, appears at the top of the list independently from the supplier. So the name, the identity of the supplier is something easy to do, but then there are proxies that even if you don't call it with a certain name, you don't call it Google, but you can imagine there are characteristics that will be associated with a particular solution. And therefore, uh, dealing with that is not going to be super, super easy. The other lesson that's going to be different here is that when, when we dealt with interoperability and interconnection in telecommunications, somehow the moat around the consumers was not as large as we have it now. So essentially, we had from the, the consumer side to make sure that, I don't know, the billing would not be affected, especially if there was dual play, triple play, or the number of portability would be ensured. So a few things that would make the consumer experience easier. Here instead it's going to be much uh, tougher because we learned a lot that there is so much inertia and behavioral inertia. So how to unstuck uh, these consumers which are not particularly conducive to you know, do more searches and even today, with uh, very experienced people downloading a different browser, Ian managed, but Lisa didn't, so it's not that easy, as you can see, for the average person in the market. The thing which is definitely different, and uh, perhaps, I don't know, Agustino and others can comment on it, is has to do with privacy, which, is, which wasn't crucial in uh, telecommunication. Sure, there is GDPR, but to be also honest, GDPR is still uh, an abstract concept. And uh, the fines are far too small. There is lots of evidence out there that are, there are repetitive um, uh, violations of GDPR and the incumbents don't care because the stakes are large and they prefer to pay small fines. But the, the, the point here is that in the absence of GDPR, which is well understood and well enforced, uh, you want to be careful with interoperability and in interconnection because if there are leakages, and there are many leakages uh, as we speak, they can just get worse. Okay? They can just get worse. The final ob observation, if I may, is that um, in the digital, we have some structural problems. It's a structure that leads to anti-competitive behavior and rules and remedies, so remedies exposed, but also rules exactly we're discussing now, often fail to address that structure. So it's a cat and mouse game that we have seen in the, in the, in the shopping and the Android uh, cases, but I can expect to see the same cat and mouse game also when practical rules exactly will be uh, discussed. And so this will be, will be involved in some further delays. Hence, one has to be uh, thinking of alternatives to that. And I think the alternative, if there is a structural problem, it has to be breakups. 
This is something we don't talk a lot, but breakups to me must be on the table for two reasons. One is a reason of um, not perhaps finding a final solution instead of delaying yet again with uh, technical details. And the other one, and this is where I have a disagreement with my former boss, uh, Commissioner Vestager, that says that this is ultimate, you know, last resort type of thing. I think this is a bit strange because it, you lose all the bargaining power if you're discussing ex ante or exposed, but you don't have on the table a realistic option of a breakup. Basically, your, 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 your hands are not going to be very, very strong. The case of functional separation I, I discussed earlier, which I think that on balance, has been good to bring in additional competition in a tough um, system like a fixed telecommunications in the UK. This functional separation occurred in the shadow of uh, a potentially realistic structural separation that the parliament was actually ready to enact if the PT had not offered some serious um, uh, commitments and uh, under undertaking. So it was in the shadow of that possibility that a good solution came out. But if you don't have that outside option, then also the solution you negotiate is going to be much weaker. Thank you. Thank you, Agustina. Tommaso mentioned you. Would you like to jump in on the issue of the GDPR? And perhaps also Ian, perhaps before we move to the other questions. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And thank you, Tommaso, for raising that point. Actually, this is <laughs> not really an issue because we are discussing exactly, we were discussing exactly the same topic in the context of um, open banking. Uh, there had been very clear guidelines, for example, from the European Data Protection Board about how, how to do it and also the different methods in which you can reduce actually the risk to share data a, 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 at all. Um, we're talking about access into the consumer interface, but there are different models in this which could be uh, could be done. And we have quite actually, I would say, sufficient experience in the context of open banking on exploring how these different methods um, uh, actually actually work. There is one called re the redirection authentication method, which is basically you through your bank account and, and your, your home banking, you can access or give access to a third party to the credentials to provide a payment service. And, and actually this, this proves that it's, it is possible to make it safe and, and, and privacy friendly and, and compliant. Uh, of course, I think that there will come uh, those that are, have no interest in this to happen to say, ah, oh, but there is a huge risk of data protection, there's a huge risk of, of uh, uh, privacy uh, privacy issues. But um, based on the experience that we have on, on for some open banking, that's not been really an, uh, an, an issue so far. Ian, I don't know if you wanted to add something as an expert, also privacy, <laughs> as a computer scientist yes, specializing in privacy. I, I've been working for much longer on data protection than I have on competition. So, um, <laughs> first of all, the um, I think the GDPR does include many of the, the general rules and principles that we need to deal with this issue. It is a general purpose horizontal um, instrument, and the European Data Protection Board which is the collection of the 27 member states, uh, national supervisory authorities has already produced some guidance, not very specifically on interoperability as a whole, but it has looked at, um, uh, you'll be aware, I'm sure um, that the EU member states are working together on making their coronavirus contact tracing apps interoperable. So that when someone, if someone who's running one of those national apps moves to a different member state. Um, ideally, uh, you know, if they, if they were later diagnosed with COVID, they can signal that through um, their own home app, but the, uh, the warnings of exposure will also flow to the people in the foreign jurisdiction um, where, they, where they have traveled to during the, the 14 days uh, roughly um, period that the, those apps gather information for. So that the EDPB has published guidance on precisely that on the data protection implications of interoperability of contact tracing apps. And I think there's quite a bit, even it's a relatively short note, but I think there's quite a bit even in there um, addressing addressing the issues that come up here. Someone asked in the in the chat, and it's quite a common um, question, so I'll, I'll, I'll very briefly mention it here as well. Isn't it, isn't it easy to say telecoms was interoperable slash interconnected, but that's a much more homogenous set of products and services, whereas platforms do very diverse things and would be much more technically complicated to make um, interoperable. Um, 
not not at the core of the fu- some of the functionality of some of those products. And I should say, I've had I've had this debate several times in the last few weeks. Um, by interoperability, we're not saying that every search product should have every last feature of Google. In this case, we're not saying that every instant messaging project sh- uh, project should have every last feature of WhatsApp. Um, or uh, Instagram Messenger or, or Facebook Messenger. We're saying that there are, core, there are core elements of functionality in some of these different services, whether it's instant messaging, social media, which many different um, uh, competitors, both the very large dominant platforms and several of their smaller platforms support. And if you look at the, uh, the Bible, as Simonetta uh, rightly calls it, the, the, the Competition and Markets Authority, thousands of pages of analysis of this you'll see there's a table where they do this for so for social media um and look i think at the 10 most popular social media apps in use in the uk and i identify a broad range of core functionality that's supported by all of those services so i think when you have that kind of core functionality and standards which support that core functionality and the World Wide web consortium has developed two standards called activity streams and activity pubs that support almost all of that social media for functionality. And indeed, over 4 million people use it in Mastodon, which is a, a, an open source competitor to, um, to Twitter. So um, yes, saying that uh, we wanted to enable competitors to clone every last feature of Google would be incredibly complex and, and unjustified. But I think that's, I don't think anyone's arguing that. I think uh, we're saying for, you know, defined services that are widely supported, uh, multiple products offering them, although often because of network effects, one one winner has taken all in the market, but the market has tipped already okay. to a significant degree. It would be very difficult for competitors to get back in. Okay, thank you so much, Ian. And exactly, I mean, that's a very nice bridge to to the thing I wanted to discuss with uh, Lisa, because it was uh, that I'm very happy to see back, sorry for all those <laughs> the, the, the technical hindrances. So the topic would be exactly the idea to make interoperability concrete, and that was done by the CMA in Annex W <laughs> of the uh, of the final report that we that yeah, has been mentioning as well, the Bible. So please, Lisa, your take on it, and generally when you think that... Um, uh, this type of uh, mandates, interoperability mandates, are most promising in terms of competition and innovation. Thank you very much. First of all, are you able to hear me and see me? Thank you very much. I had interoperability issues getting into this seminar. So um, I'm th- grateful that, that you had the patience to wait for me. So uh, thank you very much here very late in the hour. So first of all, I wanted to, to convey that, that I think that the CMA uh, did a good job and I agree with some of the conclusions that they have set out in Annex W, which is the one you're asking me about. And um, let me just very, very quickly talk you through that annex because you may not have read it or you may not remember what was in it. But basically, the CMA, they analyzes four different types of, of intervention. They talk about the data project. They talk about accessing uh, connections, cross-posting, and content interoperability. So these are the four things. And it recommends only uh, accessing connections and cross-posting uh, connections. So it does not really want to, uh, uh, they, 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 don't, they don't recommend the data uh, transfer project and they don't recommend the content interoperability. And um, where, well, I do think that it's important to, to acknowledge that the CMA say that interoperability is not a black and white solution to, to these things. Um, and while interoperability will uh, promote competition as more competitors are, are able to access the market, there are also some in, in intrusive measures, and, and that's why they, they don't think that they want to go into content interoperability. They talk about uh, the, the data uh, markets unit that they will establish, and they're basically uh, saying that that we will allow uh, that, that data uh, market unit to look at these, uh, if, if they think that, that this form of interoperability is the way forward, then they will allow them to look at it. So um, 
so that that that's basically um, more, more or less w w what they are trying to convey in 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 in, in Annex W. Uh, whether um, you asked me another question as well, which is really well. There's definitely sufficient evidence to mandate interoperability on social media. Um, and, and this is for two reasons. Firstly, uh, all the different com competition reports you've seen all over the world, you've seen the ACCC, you've seen the report from the Stiegler, I, 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 you've seen the Furman report, you have seen that there's plenty of reports and, and studies, and now, of course, the market study that you referred to uh, from the CMA. They have all uh, uh, arrived at similar findings, which is uh, uh, that in the sense that the strong network effects and the use of data makes this market, the, the social media market, kind of prone uh, uh, to monopoly. And, and, and the question is not if there is a pressing need for intervention, but rather an issue of remedy design. Uh, so... So the social media is a segment highly dependent on innovation, and, and I think therefore mandating prescriptive rules uh, with the idea of promoting competition could be counter counterproductive if it isn't done in, in, in a careful manner. Um, this does not mean that, that highly intrusive measures should be disregarded, but instead, due to consideration, it's required to, I think, strike a fair balance uh, uh, between the promotion uh, uh, of competition and, and, and protecting the, the incentive to innovate. But I do think that, that the CMA has, has, has done a fairly good job and, and also the fact that they, and they leave it to the, to, the, to the DMU to then further scrutinize these measures for the future. Thank you so much for your reflections. If I can say something personal, yes, I quite like also the fact that they try to lead to to make the difference between uh, uh, functionalities which are very innovative and then others which are not. So there's an innovation appro uh, approach there, which I think is quite promising. But then, of course, we should need perhaps to develop the, or redevelop the innovation uh, balancing test uh, as uh, was proposed by the Commission. I would say, though, that the cross-posting that they're suggesting is, of course, nothing new, uh, uh, right? I mean, the, the, the CMA has found that, that, that Facebook has degraded this functionality over time. So it's something that has already been there, but, but Facebook has, has degraded it. And, and they have done that because they argue that this wouldn't be good for privacy. And it, it, Facebook has argued that privacy concerns uh, means that the cross posting is not really ideal uh, 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 at, at the moment. But other platforms such as Instagram have retained this functionality and, and users are able to, to, to post on, on Facebook and Twitter through this. Lisa, and then uh, Katarzyna, thank you for having waited <laughs> five, 50 minutes for your turn. Um, because I think you're, I think the fact that you are here, I think, is really, it's, uh, it's uh, really uh, quite exciting because we have talked so far about competition, even GDPR, a little bit, and then, of course, innovation. But so the question here would be about the practical value of interoperability for, let's say, normal users, imagining scenarios that could be posit uh, positively affected by this change. So not only pro-competition framing, but contribu contribution to solving perhaps even more serious societal problems caused by large platforms like private censorship, monetizing disinformation, controlling valuable knowledge about humans that could be used also perhaps now during our pandemic. So what's your, what are your thoughts on that, Katarina? Uh, thank you, Simonetta. And for full disclosure, I'm also just a lawyer and an expert, not a user representative. My organization is not even an association. We, we, we do what we think is best for users. We don't represent their voice. But indeed, in this debate, uh, uh, we, uh, we try to push uh, our best understanding of the user value or, or simply value for humans. I personally hate the framing users and I think we need to abandon it Although we've been uh, <laughs> we've been we've been entangled uh, uh, in this language by by large platforms that are our enemy precisely in this battle. 
So what would be the big promise? The big promise already transpired from what others said so far, uh, the federation of, um, of social networks or the opening the gates of walled gardens uh, promises new functions uh, that uh, are very intuitive, intuitive, like the ability uh, for users to send, um, send messages across different networks, uh, the ability to access news feeds and other content from friends or, or simply public uh, sources uh, in other networks without multi-homing, without using um, other services with all it takes, including the burden of managing privacy there and the burden of, of accepting or being forced to accept uh, terms and conditions. Um, but indeed, as also Ian uh, uh, showed in, in his interventions, uh, why it is simple conceptually, it is not simple legally, it is not simple technologically, that would, uh, that would require uh, adoption, effective adoption of open protocols, uh, some kind of standardization across uh, the EU. Uh, we would face or we will face hopefully um, issues to solve when it comes to data protection, how to protect users from spam. We will face uh, data security issues. Um, I agree with comments I've seen on the chat, this is not exactly as simple as sending a text message to another uh, mobile network. So, but even if we uh, see complications around this big promise, there is a whole uh, list of smaller but not less important promises that I see in introducing mandatory interoperability. And these are honestly for me major reasons to fight for ex ante rules for large platforms that will hopefully entail uh, mandatory interoperability now, which are the smaller but not less important promises first of all i see here uh, a promise of uh, a full um, execution of the gdpr uh, the law that we have in place for last two years but that wasn't really effective in forcing large platforms to comply uh, as long as data is effectively controlled by uh, large social platforms uh, we don't have authorities we don't have practical tools uh, to for example make um, data portability uh, a reality or a give users full access to their marketing profiles, which is essential that they see, verify, and correct these. Uh, or we, we, we don't really have um, a, a clear idea how uh, people using social platforms could force them to stop using certain categories of data that are sensitive or maybe even have been collected or generated as a result of observation without user's consent. We don't have practical tools for, to, tools for this as long as that data sits on uh, these company servers uh, and uh, legal authorities like the, the data protection authorities would have to go inside, intervene in a very radical way uh, to check what's happening on the server. So for me, introducing interoperability is, is in the first place a way to get more control over our own data. I imagine a situation where um, a user is able to send um, a signal, something like a DNT, do not track me, but a more granular, more sophisticated signal using open protocol to the platform. And on the other hand, on the other side of that transaction, uh, the platform server reacts without um, me requesting um, uh, um, requesting a compliance uh, by uh, you know by the means of of, of platforms controlled uh, interface or I can imagine that. Uh, there are clients, independent clients, to manage personal data available uh, to users that will offer a much uh, better value uh, in terms of managing uh, own data, in terms of managing settings, including advertising settings because of interoperability. Uh, finally, that's last but not least, there is a promise of unbundling or functional separation of these large platforms, which would open a space for very interesting services, not only to manage own data, but to uh, modify uh, core functionalities of the platform. Uh, if we go that far, and I do hope we, we, we with the EU and the ex ante rules being on the table, we go that far, I imagine quite radical solutions happening within the platform where independent service providers 
start offering um, new ways of managing news feeds, new ways of um, of filtering out uh, disinformation, new ways of protecting users from uh, abusive advertising. So here is the answer to the social problems that you see, Manetta, also brought in your question. Uh, we clearly see uh, there is a lot of evidence, there's a lot of debate uh, showing that there are real societal harms connected to the way large platforms use algorithms to um, control people's behavior, uh, to control the debate, uh, to monetize um, people's behavior. We need to stop that vicious circle of power that feeds back uh, to platforms and gives them every day more data and more power coming with this data. And the only way to do it for me is that sort of functional separation where I can still choose um, to host my content on Facebook. I can still choose to uh, keep my profile on Facebook if I feel that that's, that's, that's something I have or I want to do. But I can free myself from being subjected to algorithmic data processing at Facebook. And more importantly, I can free myself from being targeted uh, on, by Facebook's controlled algorithms uh, that are controlled in their own uh, business uh, interests. So, so that, that, I think that that promise is the, the most important one when we discuss um, societal problems and uh, user or, or simply uh, the protection of human beings uh, uh, online. Thank you so much, Tarjina. Really fascinating. Um, so uh, our time is uh, up. Uh, it's 5 p.m. Uh, the reason also is my students have uh, other classes to attend. So <laughs> that's it. I can keep them. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you want to say one final word, any of you, uh, you have 30 seconds. Uh, the, it was much too short and we had some... Uh, technical issues, so we should, I think, uh, repeat this uh, wonderful conversation where well, I found it wonderful. Uh, so, is there anything you would like to say as final words? No, I take it as a no. So, I thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I'm really, I couldn't look at the chat. I hope that uh, Astor is making a copy of the discussions in the chat. Uh, because I'm really very curious. I've seen that Victoria has been very active, <laughs> but I'm not good at multitasking. So thank you again to everybody. Take care. Thank you. And uh, let's hope for the best. Okay. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.